Hi, everybody. Good morning. Isn't it a great Sunday to be in church together? Well, I feel like every Sunday is a great Sunday to be in church. But it really is my privilege to add my welcome to the one that Megan has already extended. So good to have you here with us. We are Riverview Church. We're a good news community on mission. We love God. We follow Jesus. And we're having our lives transformed. And that's an exciting thing that we would love to invite you to join us in. And I want to just add my thanks as well. What an amazing total, right? We were chasing $400,000, and by God's grace and your generosity, we were able to get there. So just give yourselves a a pat on the back one more time, or clap, do what, I mean, just do whatever you, you have the urge to do. But hey, welcome, so good to be together. Um, If we've never met, my name's Ryan, I don't know if I already said my name, did I say that? Man, when you get up here, sometimes you're like, what did I already say? Anyway, I'm Ryan, nice to meet you. Um, And it's my privilege to get to open up the scriptures this morning. And before I do, I just wanted to take a moment to just acknowledge that it it is such a wonderful privilege to stand up here and to speak, but also just to recognize that it actually is also a whole lot of work, and it requires a lot of preparation, a lot of prayer, a lot of talking to yourself, weirdly, as well. And the reason I say that is not to kind of glorify what I'm about to do, but is actually to acknowledge our senior minister, Steve McCready. And... He's been here at Riverview for about seven or eight months. And did you know he's preached every single Sunday since he's been here? See, sometimes when I'm speaking here at Burswood, he would actually be speaking up at Joondala. And so I wanted to just acknowledge him. Now, he has earned a well-deserved break. And so for the next few weeks, he's not going to be in the pulpit. He's going to be able to just hear the word like each and every one of us has the privilege to do. So I know that he is actually watching online this morning. He's not here. He's on a little vacation with the family. So can we just take a moment to thank Steve and acknowledge the amazing, amazing work. Steve, thank you for helping shape and form us around God's Word. We really do appreciate it. Now, if you were here last week, you'd be familiar that Steve launched us into a new series in the Psalms, a series we have simply titled The God Who or The God Whom just if you want to be a little bit more fancy. I don't know what's right. And uh, each week, we're going to take some time. We're going to explore some different psalms together, the prayer book and the song book of Jesus. And hopefully, as we do, we're going to discover God afresh, uh, learn new things about his character, about his love, and about the way he interacts with us as his people. Now, if you weren't here last week, we started off by exploring Psalm 23, If you weren't here, I'd encourage you to jump online and have a listen to that message. It was a a wonderful start to the series and helped also build a a great framework as to how we're going to understand the Psalms. Now, Steve gave some helpful advice, and I want to kind of just reiterate it this morning. Last week, he mentioned, and he said that as we read the Psalms, it would be wise of us to do so as we're doing it over the shoulder of the writer. Do you remember that? so that we read the Psalms over the shoulder of the writer. In other words, we understand that through the Psalms, we have the privilege of hearing the story and the testimony uh, of the people who are writing them, alongside their proclamation as to who God is, His character and His promises. And so in some ways, the Psalms acts like a book of secondhand theology. Now, Steve also mentioned last week, and I, this rung true with me, that the challenge is often the Psalms can be really difficult to read. They can be really challenging, difficult to approach, because I feel a little bit like when I come to Psalms, it's a little bit like Gollum or Smeagol from Lord of the Rings, and you're not quite sure what attitude you're going to get out of it, and uh, I find that really difficult when I come to Psalms, because I read a Psalm like Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I mean, how good is that Psalm, right? Life-giving and encouraging, but then I flip over a few pages and I read you know, a Psalm like Psalm 88. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? Or or how many Psalms say, how long, O God? How long, O God? And Psalms are full of emotion, whether it's joy or fear, disappointment, sadness, perplexity, you name it. If you can name an emotion, it's probably there in the Psalms. And you know what, honestly? I feel like part of the challenge is often we don't know what to do with emotion, right? Right? I mean, if you're anything like me, I I remember an experience I had dating Renee in the early years and having this moment where I like, I don't know how to deal with emotion. I remember, you know, I I grew up with no sisters. I just had brothers. And so we weren't very good at expressing our emotions. Or we did. We just 
wrestled and yelled and fought as brothers do. But I remember, you know, on a couple of different occasions when I started dating Renee, me doing, you know, silly things or unthoughtful things, and she would begin to get upset. And she would begin to cry. And now, can I just say, I'm much better at this now. But like, I didn't know what to do. She would start kind of tearing up and I'd just, you know, like a dog when it's about to go to bed in its bed. I'm like, not quite sure what to do. There, 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 there. You'll be okay. I mean, that's not what you, that's not what you say when uh, they're upset. Uh, you know, I, I'd sit there like a fool, right? Like, I was thinking, I'm not a therapist. I, I didn't have sisters. In fact, I wasn't even sure if I had emotions. But slowly over time, right, I, I've realized many, many years later after lots of trial and error, after much listening and learning, you know, I've discovered that emotions are a part of any relationship, any healthy relationship at least. And emotions are always expressed in different ways. And you know what? Effectively holding our emotions is incredibly important. And you see, all Renee needed me to do often was actually just to listen and to, to hear her and to talk through what it is she was feeling and experiencing, to process it, right? And of course, sometimes apologize depending on what I had done. But most of us here in the room, we, we grew up in families that held emotions one of two ways, right? You either were in a family where you would just suppress all of your emotions, you'd just hold it down and just push it down further and further, never let your emotions out, or you're in a family that just like let your emotions run free. And so when something happens, you're all in a yelling match and you just, you, you let them out and they kind of control you. So most likely you grew up in a match where there was lots of, uh, a, a home where there was lots of yelling matches happening, or you grew up in a home that it was all very quiet, but you know, under the surface, there was a lot of stuff going on. And I, I love that the Psalms present for us a different approach, an alternative option to dealing with our emotions, not to suppress and ignore our emotions or not to be overcome by our emotions, but rather to actually pray through our emotions, to lean into what is a very real experience and feeling and actually to process it with God. And the Psalms provide for us a framework as to how to walk and talk with God through all of life's ups and downs in conversation with Him. And you see, when I, when I look at the Psalms, I often reflect to myself, you know, how much of my prayer life is just, sanitized and immersed in kind of fake positivity. Because do I pray like our psalmist do? Not often, I mean, I, I clean up my prayers and say, oh Lord, it's all good. But I think, he, you know, he wants our honest self. And if the psalms teach us anything, it's actually that we ought to put the mask down and come before God as our authentic and honest self. He wants the real us, not some fake version of us. So. With that in mind, we're going to open up the Psalms together. But before I do, can we just pray? Can we pray an honest prayer? And maybe for you this morning, your honest prayer is just opening up your hands before God. And so we're going to try and put down the masks this morning as we open up the Psalms. So let's pray. God, we, we're here today. And I know for some of us, we're here and I don't know, we're not feeling the best version of ourselves. We're, we're unwell, we're tired, we're exhausted. God, we bring before you what it is we are holding and feeling. And God, in, in all honesty, we would just love it today if as we open up your word, you would bring divine encouragement to our souls. God, that you would breathe rest upon us, hope upon us. God, I pray today as we open up your scriptures, would you remind us of who you are? And because of who you are, we would walk away with a great deal of confidence. We thank you for our time together. We pray that you would bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want you to um, open up and turn to Psalm 91. Look, I got a fresh Bible for my birthday the other week. 
It's such a Christian thing to say, isn't it? I got a Bible for my birthday. It's like real leather, so it smells good too. The problem with a new Bible though, right, is it's like, it's blank and bare. You can't transfer your notes from an old Bible. The digital days are coming. All right, Psalm 91. And uh, Josh read for us about half of the Psalm, but we're gonna read through this uh, together and it's gonna be on the screen behind me. It says this, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you'll find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say the Lord is your refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? And that's Psalm 91. It's an amazing portion of scripture. But you know what? In Psalm 91, scholars can't quite be sure who actually penned this song or this prayer. Uh, the, in the Septuagint, which is like the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, it has a superscription that says a prayer, a praise of David, but most scholars aren't quite sure who actually wrote this because it's not in the original manuscript, that, that little superscription. And so in this instance, we actually don't really know who it is, whose shoulder we're looking over as we read this psalm. But whoever it is, whoever's shoulder it is we're looking over, it's a person with a story and a testimony that leads them to declare with great confidence that the Lord is a faithful stronghold who is worthy of our trust. Now, in context, Psalm 91, of course, comes after Psalm 90 and before Psalm 92. But in context of the wider book, Psalms 88 through to 90 are some of those really kind of deeply emotional and raw psalms of lament. They're honest and they're, they're raw, and in them, God appears to be silent. But as we arrive at Psalm 91, the long-awaited silence is, is over. And Psalm 91 finishes with God speaking a word of liberation over us. It's like this psalm acts as a little bit of a full stop or a reset button of what's come before, because in it, God declares that he will answer his people. He will be with them. He will rescue them. He will honor them. And finally, it tells us that he will demonstrate his salvation. Now, if you, if you kind of study this psalm closely, you actually might notice that within the first few lines, our psalmist wants to make it really, really clear who it is that he or she is talking about. And so they don't just mention one name of God, they don't just mention two names of God, but they mention four divine names. I was trying to figure out how many fingers I had up. Four divine names. Because the author wants what is about to be said to be attributed to the right person. They wanna make their testimony to be heard clearly and for credit to be received where credit is due. It's a little bit like when you go to a cafe and they ask you for your name of the order. Like later, when you order a coffee from Milk and Honey, they're gonna ask you for a first name, right? They most likely won't ask you for a first, last, and middle name because the chances of there being another Ryan or Brian, as sometimes it's written, is, is probably pretty slim. 
But when you're making a really significant purchase, they're not gonna ask you for just your first name. Like when you go to get a loan for a house that you're buying, you don't just give them your first name, you give them your last name, you give them your middle name, you give them your date of birth, you give them every detail you have because it's important to attribute it to the right person. And so in Psalm 91, there's, there's these four names that, that come up. The first is Most High. And this is a title that kind of cuts everything else down to size to remind us who is being spoken of. The next name is Shaddai or Almighty, which is the name that sustained the uh, displaced patriarchs throughout Exodus. The next name is the Lord, Yahweh, a really familiar name for the Jewish people. This was the covenant name of God as it was revealed to Moses. And then finally, the general term is used, God or El Elohim, which of course would have been familiar across many cultural contexts, except they are saying, this is my God. And so the psalmist wants to make sure that we're attributing all that's about to be spoken to the right person. Now, before I, I share some kind of just devotional thoughts from this psalm, I wanna just provide a little bit of a, a breakdown of, of Psalm 91 to help us understand what is playing out as we read this passage of scripture. And so we're gonna have some slides come up behind me and hopefully this will make sense of it. Now, can I just say, just, I'm gonna pause. Man, I've been writing the word Psalm a lot this last week and every time I see it now, I feel like it's spelt wrong. It's not. A P and an S should never be together in the English language, right? Goodness me, it's, it's been stressing me out this week. Uh, look, for the, the, the kind of nerds among us, I love a bit of etymology, you know, like the, where words come from. The, psalm, the word psalm actually comes from a Greek word which originally meant to pluck or to strum. Uh, and, and it's eventually come to us as this word. So it's the idea of making song, and that's the word that we have. So it's not actually an English word, but P and S shouldn't go together. Anyway, here's, here's our entire prayer laid out for us in Psalm 91. I don't expect you to be able to read all of that. That's totally okay. Now, in, in Psalm 91, most scholars, most people would agree that there are three voices that speak in this psalm. And this is really helpful for us to understand if we're gonna read this well. The first voice is one of introduction. The second is one of testimony. And then the third is one of God. And each one of these voices plays a really important role in the psalm. And so we start off with the introduction, right? This is a little bit like in a movie where, you know, Morgan Freeman's lovely voice comes on and he's about to narrate something that's gonna help us make sense of then what is to come. The, the, the first line, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Isn't that a beautiful line? It's almost as though it was borrowed from a, a, a wisdom psalm or a proverb and so for, verse one is kind of like the truth and the wisdom that our writer is inviting us to discover as we look over their shoulder and then respond accordingly, to respond by making God our refuge and, our, and dwelling with him. So verse one serves us as an introduction to the subject of the prayer. This is kind of what's being spoken about and test, testified to. But it also acts as the qualifications of the person who's then about to speak. He or she is speaking from a place of deep personal faith, and they hold this introduction to be true in their own life. The next section, verse two to, uh, verses two to 13, take us through this wonderful testimony, somebody's story, and this is what they have experienced. Now, it appears that they've experienced God's great faithfulness, right? But it also sounds as though they have experienced what it's like not to experience God as the place of your refuge and fortress. And so their experiences had led them to this place of being able to declare these things of God. Now, part one of the testimony begins with, I will say of the Lord, here's all the things I've experienced. And then part two of the testimony is, uh, hey, if you were to say of the Lord, here's the, some of the things that you might experience. It's, it's a testimony that begins to invite people in to the story. And so verses three and four tell us he will save us from the fowler's snare, which I'm sure was a personal experience, and from deadly pestilence or deadly diseases. He'll cover you with his feathers and under his wings you'll find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. And you know, this testimony employs creative imagery, right? Like pictures of, 
protection, of, of safety, of security and stability. And the psalmist tells us that nothing can cause us harm or fear when someone is tucked under the wings of God. Not terrors, nor arrows, nor destruction, nor disease. Now, a little bit of a side kind of frustrated Bible teacher moment. You know, if we were to read Psalm 91, and particularly verse 4, God will cover us with his feathers, and under his wings we will find refuge. Honest question, does that make God a giant duck? <laughs> like, does that make God a seagull? It would explain why Jesus spent so much time at the beach, right? Now, here's the thing. I, I'm assuming God is not a giant duck. I'm happy to be proven wrong one day when I stand before him face to face, but Jesus showed us that most likely God is not a giant duck. But here's the thing. Some people read the Bible like that. And you see, it's really important that we as mature followers of Jesus learn to read the scriptures literarily, not literally. What I mean by that is if you read the words of Psalm 91 literally and walk away with that today, you're going to walk away thinking God is a giant duck. But if you learn to read the scriptures literarily, what that means is you're going to take into account context and language, and the fact that our author is using poetic language to describe some of the characteristics of God. They're using imagery to talk about the nature and the characteristics of God. And so we need to be people who learn to read our Bibles well, if we're going to understand God well. Does that make sense? So context, genre, occasion, all of those things are really important. Otherwise, you'll walk around thinking God's a duck, and I don't want that for you. Now, of course, this imagery we've just talked about is used to capture the fact that God is warm and that he's near and that he is protective over his people, that he'll do the fighting and all we need to do is kind of rest under his wing. And, and you know, a, a, a bird analogy kind of seems weird, but you would know it's a really good picture if you've ever been down to the Swan River and had a swan come near you. Like, those things are feisty and they are really protective. Uh, trust me, I have ex experienced that. And so the psalmist gives us this poetic testimony that God's faithful and he protects those who find refuge in him and place their trust in him. Now, the psalmist also makes some really, really big promises, really, really big promises. He's like a salesman kind of inviting us to experience what he or she has experienced. And the psalmist's testimony and their personal experience serve us as an encouragement to come and embrace the way of wisdom of trusting in God and making him your refuge and your dwelling place. It's a bit like when you find a really good food place, right? And you're convinced it's so good and you wanna tell everyone what you have experienced. In fact, just on Friday night, I was telling some people about Quick Curry. Oh, has anyone been to Quick Curry just down the road in Rivervale? Some wonderful butter chicken. And in fact, I would say it is the world's best butter chicken. Now, here's the thing. I've experienced something great. I want you to experience it. So I'm saying it's the world's best. Can I guarantee it is the world's best butter chicken? No, probably not. And so the psalmist here is, is making some huge promises because of what they have experienced. And, and they make some promises that the Lord then later doesn't actually guarantee. Because that's what we do as humans, right? We're like, God will be everything and he'll, like, you'll never experience any trouble. And God's like, I didn't say that. He'll experience trouble. And so finally, after the flattering testimony, uh, in verse 13 into 16, the Lord speaks. And he declares that to those who love him, he'll answer, he'll be present with, he will deliver, or the word there could potentially be translated equip or strengthen. He will honor. And of course, the Lord assures that his own will enjoy themselves as his children in this life and the life to come and that they will see his salvation. You see, the Lord does not guarantee a life without trouble, as the psalmist kind of uh, hints at us. In fact, the Lord just says, hey, I'll be present with you in trouble, which sounds a lot like the words of Jesus, right? And so the Lord assures his people, uh, as a wonderful man by the name of Walter Brueggemann once said, that this is ground for confidence, that the last word is not spoken by us, but it's spoken to us. And so the Lord says he will be with us in trouble. 
and with long and everlasting life, he will show us his salvation. Can you say amen to that today? Now, with the, the last kind of five or so minutes of our time together, I want to just sit and reflect on uh, what I sense is the main idea of Psalm 91. The testimony of our psalmist, what, what are they wanting to show us? And I believe it's this, it's the God who is our stronghold. The God who is our stronghold. Now, I'm not sure how familiar you are with strongholds or with fortresses. Maybe for you, like me, you grew up playing with like little knights and little castles, and that's your expertise on fortresses. Or maybe when you were younger, you used to build forts out of pillows and, and, and sheets and all that. Did anyone do that when they were younger? Oh, not many people. Oh, just me. So I'm an expert on forts then. And, uh, you know, essentially... A stronghold, it's a fortified area with, with strengthened walls. And it, of course, often can be reinforced by geography, by hills or by higher places that keep the enemy and, and evil out. In short, a stronghold is a refuge of safety, security, and stability. You know, it's a welcome place for weary travelers. It's a place of respite for an anxious and a fearful soul. And maybe that's how you felt about the fort you built, or at least I built when I was a little kid, safe and secure and stable. And you know, I'm, I'm really aware that within Christian circles, often a stronghold comes with a whole lot of negative connotations, you know, to do with um, captivity and bondage and all of, all of those kind of things. But it's interesting that God himself is likened to a stronghold. And so strongholds aren't the problem. The strongholds in which we choose to find refuge in are the problem. Does that make sense? And uh, Mark Sayers, who is, uh, he's a brilliant uh, thinker, Christian thinker and leader and writer from Melbourne. He recently wrote a book uh, titled A Non-Anxious Presence. And in his book, he explored this idea of, of strongholds a little bit. And I want to just read you a little bit out from uh, page 57. It says, when anxious and concerned about our safety, stability, and security, we create strongholds. In the ancient world, nomads would band together in tribal groups, gaining protection in numbers. And as agriculture brought greater security and stability, settlements eventually grew into cities, and city, cities enabled the storing of seeds and crops their insurance against the unpredictable, their walls and insurance against the unpredictability of nature. And what he explores in his book is that, you know, humans, when we are exposed to the chaos and the danger of nature, we realize very quickly that we are not God. Our vulnerability, our mortality, and our lack of control is, is exposed. And so strongholds form as we seek out or build protective places in which we can find safety and security and stability in threatening or chaotic environments. You see, beyond the stronghold, Sayers writes, anxiety becomes our constant companion. So when we're not in a place where we can find those things, we feel anxious or fearful. And so we need those things. And, and those things, safety, security, and stability, are not wrong in, in any way. But the challenge becomes how we meet those needs that we each have. You see, ancient travelers moving from one stronghold to another would find themselves vulnerable in between. You know, after killing his brother Abel, Cain walked in fear. Genesis 4 tells us that despite God's reassurance over his safety, he wandered restlessly. He was separated from God's presence, and so Cain goes ahead and he builds a city a stronghold of protection for he and his family, and its walls, in a way, act as a replacement for the security and the safety and the stability that's offered by God in his presence. So safe in the walls of the stronghold, we find relief from our fears and our anxiety. You know, I, I think this illuminates a truth for us, that when we are anxious, we seek out strongholds. Or if we can't find a stronghold, we... we build one. We create one. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Ryan, like, what on earth are you talking about? I have not seen any strongholds or fortresses in the city when I drive past them. Now, of course you haven't. We're not speaking literally. But I wonder if I was to ask you the question, where do you find a sense 
of safety, security, and stability. Where does your confidence lie? You know, where do you derive stability from? I mean, perhaps your sense of security and stability comes from money, comes from finance. And so when you're feeling anxious or wearisome or fearful, all you need to do is open up your banking app and uh, check your bank balance or your superannuation and and your sense of confidence is restored. You're going to be okay. If you're anything like me, you don't get much confidence from looking at your bank balance or your superannuation. But perhaps you look elsewhere, right? Like maybe you found refuge in the stronghold that is mind-numbing entertainment. It's, in a way, become like your drug, your form of escapism. The way that you feel safe and secure and stable is by, you know, flicking on a TV show when you get home from work and completely detaching from the world. Or perhaps you found uh, confidence in your own health, whether it be your mental health or your physical health. Or maybe you found it in your ability or your wisdom. And so your sense of security and stability and safety comes from your ability to perform or to achieve. Or maybe even relationships have become the place of safety, stability, and security. Maybe even a spouse, and you're actually deriving all of those things from that person in an unhealthy way. Now, please hear me. I, I'm not saying any, any of those things are bad in of themselves. You know, finances are amazing. Rest and entertainment is wonderful. Health, ability, relationships, all of these things are gifts from God, but they are not good gods in of themselves. And because of each, each, of one, each one of those things will, will eventually fail us, will eventually dis- disappoint us, they'll let us down. And so they aren't good places to find refuge, but they are great things to enjoy from a place of true refuge. So I encourage you this week, I, I want to kind of give you a little bit of homework, just to go around your normal business, do, do what you normally do, but I want you just to really consider for yourself, what, are, what strongholds do we seek out within our culture? Like, what are the strongholds that, that we, we, we are drawn to within our culture? Learn to become aware of the, the places and the spaces that we tend to find refuge in. And you know what? There are many, and this is not just like a Christian thing. We are all looking for safety and security and stability. And so we look in many, many different places. In fact, if we have learned anything over the last couple of years... It's that we are not as in control as we thought we were, right? Like a a tiny little virus from a regional province somewhere in China has the ability to destroy the strongholds that projected this mirage of stability, right? We've kind of seen that happen over the last two years. The economy and government, the internet, Hollywood, you know, all of these are systems and strongholds that we have created that bring us a sense of stability and security and and safety. Now, they're not all bad things, but we rely on them for those things. And you know what? I actually think the world is becoming wise to the fact that all of those things are not as solid as we once thought. They're not as reliable as we once thought. And friends, it is good news that we have a God who has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ, who loves us and says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's a firm foundation. We can rely on him. And so Psalm 91, right? Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of of the Almighty, or in the words of Jesus, whoever abides in me, if you remain in me, I'll remain in you. You don't need to try and produce fruit, but remain in me, and it will be produced in you. I mean, this is good news, and it's the good news that I believe our world, the world that feels like it's on a knife edge, you know, it's what it's looking for. Safety, security, and stability, all found in our creator God. So if you're a follower of Jesus here today, here's here's a little practice I wanna encourage you to to build into your week ahead. There's more homework, you ready for it? If you're not a follower of Jesus, you get a free pass here, lucky you, but for all of us who follow Jesus, this is something I'd encourage you to build into your week this week. Because we are, you know, we're kingdom practitioners. Faith isn't theory, it's actually lived out. And so I wanna encourage you to live this out this week. 
So I'm not gonna tell you, I'm not gonna tell you, don't look at your bank balance anymore, or don't turn on Netflix. I'm not gonna say, you know, when you have the urge to flick on Netflix, pull out your Bible and read it for four hours. I mean, that would be really nice, but let's take small steps to kind of get there, right? So here's what I, what I encourage you to do this week. When you feel anxious or weary or fearful and you, you sense the need for you to find safety and stability and security, and you have that urge to find that in a stronghold outside of God, for example, you have the urge to check your bank balance. Here's what I want you to do. Before you do that, just pause for five seconds. Just acknowledge that God is with you, thank him for his provisions, and then Steve taught us breath prayer the last week, right? Just pray a short prayer. Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress, the God in whom I trust. Lord, you are my refuge, my fortress, the God in whom I trust. And then go ahead, open up your banking app. Now, I, I pray that as you do that more and more, you'll, you'll lose the urge to find stability and security in those things. But I think what you're doing is you practice something really simple like that is you're actually reorienting your heart and your mind. You're reminding your soul that your safety and your stability and your security doesn't come from things made by man, but comes from the Lord. It's the process of, of retraining our new creation selves to trust and to find refuge in our source, not in the supply that he gives us finding refuge in the one who gives the manna from heaven, not the manna from heaven itself. And so this week, as you engage in those things, I just encourage you to build that small, simple practice into your life. Pause, thank God for the thing that he's given you, and then remind yourself that he is your fortress and your refuge, the place in which you trust. Does that sound okay? Sound doable? We're gonna do it? Uh, there was a little less on the last one, but that's fine. Well, hey, before I uh, close and we just sing together to, to conclude our time, I, I just really wanna extend to you the same invitation that our psalmist extends to each and every one of us, and that is to trust in the Lord, to make him our dwelling place, to extend to each and every one of us the invitation to find our lives and our stories and our hope and our future placed in God, because he's good. He's trustworthy, he's kind, and he's a firm foundation for our lives to be hidden in and built upon. You know, the writer of Hebrews tells us that this kind of trust, the trust in a God who is unchanging, acts as an anchor for our souls, firm and secure, not being pulled around left to right, but stable, safe, and secure, hidden in God. So I want to invite you just to stand with me. And I'm just going to pray. Pray that each and every one of us, wherever we're at on our journey with Jesus, would learn to, to trust a little more, to allow Him to be our refuge and our fortress. And then we're going to sing together to the one whom we can trust. So why don't you join with me? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for who you are. So thankful that in you, God, we find our great stronghold, a refuge, a fortress, a place for weary travelers. Thank you that you restore our souls, that God, your promise is whoever dwells in your house will rest with you. And so Lord, we thank you for who you are. We remind ourselves of who you are. And Lord, I pray for each and every person here this week as we participate with you in the mission you have for this world. God, would we find you as our refuge and our fortress. Lord, as we have the urge to place our trust in other areas, God, would we be reminded of how true and trustworthy you are. God, we're grateful for your word today. Grateful that it breathes life into our souls, that it reorients our hearts and our minds for the sake of your kingdom and glory. So we thank you for who you are. 
remind us this week. Don't let us go long without being reminded that you are our great fortress, our refuge, the God in whom we trust. And we pray that in your name. Amen.